obviously uh, an issue which has been a big part of this budget process has been the raise the age, and there is a significant component of this budget which deals with the raised age issue. And what I really want you to do is help outline to me exactly how this changes current law and what the procedures will be. And let me just start off with, sure. for many years we've had the category of a juvenile delinquent, which starts at the age of seven in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. I believe under the new law, it will continue to be the age of seven. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, traditionally, juvenile delinquent was the ages of seven to 15. Does this bill actually increase that from seven to 17 for violations and other types of offenses such as that? For misdemeanors and felonies that are removed to family court, it does, yes. And what about violations? How are violations now going to be handled? Uh, for, for, begin a 16, for a 16 year old and 17 year old, how are violations going to be handled once this law goes into effect? Local criminal court. It will continue to be yes. <clears throat> local criminal court for violations. Okay. Then going on to the category of juvenile offender, something we've had for many years which are essentially those who are 13, 14, 15 years of age. Again, it's my understanding that this bill is keeping the requirements and definitions of juvenile offender very much the way it's been for many decades. Would that that's, also be the that's case? That's correct. Okay. So now, for many times and during a previous debate, you and I discussed the youthful offender and the options you have with that. My understanding is that this portion of the budget is going to eliminate the youthful offender and create a new category of adolescent offender. Would that be correct? No, it does not uh, limit youthful offender. It does not. Okay. So uh, can you please describe to me then what an adolescent offender is as defined under this uh, bill as part of the budget? Well, adolescent defender means a person charged with a felony right. committed on or after October 1st, 2018, when he or she was 16 years of age, or on or after October 1st, 2019, when he or she was 17 years of age. And up until this time, 16, 17-year-olds would go to either the county court or the Supreme Court, which would be very similar to an adult. So my understanding is that in this bill, we are still going to have cases in the Supreme Court or County Court, but we are creating a new youth part of the Superior Court. Is that what correct. this bill does? Okay. That's and, correct. And, and all felony charges will have to start in the uh, criminal or the Superior Court, either the uh, County Court or the Supreme Court. Okay, and that's why I wanted to get but at. The youth so, part of those courts. Right, so what I'm going to get at is that they are not automatically going to family court, they are automatically going to be arraigned and commenced in the youth part of superior court. That's correct, the okay. felony cases. Felony cases, correct. Well, let me back up. What is going to happen with misdemeanor cases? Misdemeanor cases are gonna start in the family court. They're going to start in the family court. Once they're in the family court, is there any mechanism for them to be removed to the Supreme or the County Court? No, there is not. Okay, so they're going to continue to remain in the, in the family court. There's no other option. That's right. So going back to the youth part of the Superior Court, it's my understanding that the one presiding over this part is going to be a family court judge, not a County Court or Supreme Court judge. That's correct. And the uh, family court judge in the, in the youth part will uh, be required to uh, to use family court principles in handling the case. And can you describe when you say family court principles, what can you describe more fully what you mean by that? It means that uh, all of the services that might be available to the family court and not to the adult court, be it the county or the Supreme Court, would be available to the family court judge in the youth part to use those services for the appropriate cases as opposed to uh, not using uh, services that would be available in the family court. Soon I'm going to be getting into questions on how cases can move from the Supreme or County Court to the family court. But before then, I just want to jump ahead for simplicity purposes. 
Let's say it's eventually determined, uh, let's say it's a murder two case. Mm -hmm. And this case is then going to stay in the youth part of county or Supreme Court. Does the right of a jury trial still exist for that type of offense? Yes. Okay. And the case is going to be presided over by a family court judge. Would That's that be correct. correct? Okay. And just the issue I have with this is that family court judges are not those who are ordinarily dealing with murder cases along the lines. So we're now going to be having family court judges dealing with jury trials for murder too. It's about time they learn. Okay. <laughs> if and they'll you be that trained in the process. Upstate, many judges do both, as you know. When I then want to get into the procedure of if you have, let's talk about not, there are, my understanding, there's approximately four offenses, which I think essentially are going to stay. In, well, I'm going to ask, actually ask this question. Let's say you have a case of murder two. Is there a way that could be transferred down to the family court? Only with the agreement of all parties. Okay, so it can be transferred from Supreme or County to family, but the district attorney must consent for that to occur. Correct. Okay. For in other types of offenses that are currently in Supreme or County court, what is the procedure which will move them down to family court? And again, my understanding is mm -hmm. there may be different procedures, whether they're violent or nonviolent. If you can just describe when the court, when the case sure. is automatically in, you know, Supreme or County, yes. how do they get down to family? Okay, so let's start with the nonviolent felony cases. Those cases, uh, as you've suggested, will begin in the youth part of the Superior Court. And uh, that case will automatically go to the family court within 30 days unless the district attorney decides to make a motion and show extraordinary circumstances to the judge and then he, to keep the case in the youth part of the criminal court. Uh, for what we characterize as nonviolent, violent felony offenses, those cases that are labeled violent by the penal law of our state, but actual, in actuality, when you look at those particular statutes, you will find that there are many, many uh, crimes that are nonviolent, even though they're labeled as violent by the penal law. So in those cases, uh, they're be gonna, going to be treated a little bit differently and re be required to submit by the judge who's looking at the case and looking at the uh, instrument in front of them to decide whether or not it passes three tests. One of those tests would be whether or not a weapon was involved in furtherance of the crime. The other one would be whether there was significant physical injury involved in the case and the last test would be whether there were any sex crimes employed during the course of uh, the commission of the crime. And if the judge found in those cases that none of those factors were present, then the case could be transferred to the uh, family court. And also remember that then the, there would then be an additional uh, crack at it if, you, if the district attorney wanted to keep that case in the criminal part to show the judge that there were extraordinary circumstances to keep it in the criminal part. But if I'm correct, it doesn't require district attorney consent. It just requires a district attorney to be heard before the judge. That's right. The judge having the ultimate discretion. That's right. And by the way, I'm glad you asked that question because this was actually a compromise that was made at the table with the governor and uh, Republican senators in order to make an accommodation to both sides and the governor was uh, very helpful in presiding over this so that we would have a situation where uh, only those cases where the truly violent felons would stay in the criminal part and those kids who were not violent would be able to find their way to the family court where they not only could get superior services but would be able to get better outcomes uh, for their lives not only with the services that were employed but by not receiving a criminal record at the end of all this so that they could change their life around. And when you say what you consider to be nonviolent, violent offenses, because the penal law technically characterizes them violent, but yes. you say nonviolent, can you give me examples sure. of what some of those crimes would be? 
Uh, well, the classic example that I like to use is burglary in the second degree, mm -hmm. which is a violent felony under our penal law. And burglary, in most instances, ought to be a violent felony. Not in most, but in most of the cases, uh, I guess you could say that. However, just take, for example, a uh, bunch of young kids who happen on a porch in uh, Long Island in Nassau County, and they see that uh, there's nobody in the house, and they decide to have a party inside. And they go in the house and, you know, have, eat the food, uh, throw junk all over the place. Now, under the law, that's a violent felony. A lot of people don't know that, but that's a violent felony because they entered these present <coughs> premises unlawfully and committed a crime. And so, in that instance, if nobody had a gun or a knife or a weapon or used it, and nobody had uh, uh, a sex, committed a sex crime while they were there, and nobody committed an assault that caused significant physical injury, that case could go to the family court. Let's say we do have a case, though, of an assault with a physical, serious physical injury, one that, for example, causes a, a broken bone, which is usually a category of serious physical injury. How does that case get from the Superior Court to the Family Court? Well, technically it wouldn't, because if it's serious physical injury, then uh, it's out. It doesn't pass the three-part test. But is there any mechanism, because for example, we talked about earlier that m murder two can go from youth park to family court with consent of the DA. What happens to that? Anytime, and you have to remember, the overriding principle here is any time that all parties agree, the judge, the district attorney, and the defense attorney, they can go to the family court. Right, and what I'm just trying to distinguish is between those cases where the district attorney has consent or if you want to use a better lack of term, a veto power over being transferred from superior to family. I'm just trying to get in those instances whereby a case, for example, serious physical injury may start in superior court. The DA may object, but the judge in the judge's discretion may say, this could still be moved over to family court. Could that still exist? So if you have an assault with a serious physical injury with a, a breaking of a bone. Let me, let we, me say it again. And they maybe. make a motion to move it to gotcha. superior to family. I got gotcha. you. Uh, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Yeah. If it doesn't pass the test, the test is conducted by the judge who's examining the uh, complaint before him. And if he determines that there's serious physical injury, it doesn't go to the family court, period. Just want Unless to all parties agree. I just want to clarify that. So. Um, just to get to one other part of the bill, just quickly, dealing with um, video interrogations of suspects. This is something we've talked about yes. in the past. Uh, my understanding is, is that this bill, is what's included here is very similar to what you and I have discussed in the past, that uh, if it's a custodial interrogation, the police are required to videotape it. Uh, if it is not videotaped, then the court has to go and d d make its own determination as to whether there are a number of factors, whether there's a good excuse why that interrogation was not videotaped. Would that be a, a fair representation of what this bill does? This bill has uh, broader exceptions than the one that we debated earlier. This is uh, uh, an easier bill for the district attorney to get around or the police to get around uh, the requirement of conducting uh, videotaping of, of custodial interrogations. As a matter of fact, it doesn't really uh, require uh, a videotaping of the entire interrogation just when custody, where custody is defined in those cases. And is there any and it should be it should be really started at the time that the interrogation uh, begins. Is there any funding uh, in this budget bill to provide for local police departments to purchase such equipment necessary to comply with the power of the bill? Yeah, it, there isn't, but there's a very number of uh, limited crimes that it applies to. Unlike the bill that uh, was more broad, the one that I introduced and was passed here earlier. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.